547 Greatest Hits Radio with the drinks trolley just trundling past very usefully. Uh, we have pub landlady Susie. Well, actually, she's the producer of the show, really, but she just lives in a pub. Um, what have you grabbed for us today? Well, I've got something very special today. It's a, it's a wheat beer called We Are Everyone, and it was made by female brewers in Bristol for International Women's Day, solely by female brewers. Luster Grounded is the brewery, and it's called We Are Everyone. Delicious. Uh, very good. Very nice. Thank you very much indeed. Today's confession comes from Hazel. Father Simon, Matt, and whichever of Susie or Holly you've released from the tat cupboard for the day. <laughs> nice. My confession dates back to 1995, when having completed two years of my degree in German, I was shipped off on my year abroad. I was feeling particularly cocky and confident as having achieved an A in GCSE German, Passed my A-level and studied German for two years at university. My German was amazing, wasn't it? Oh, really? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> my university had a link with the University of Leipzig, which was formerly in East Germany. And this being 1995, it wasn't that long after the wall had come down and not a lot had changed. Whereas in West Germany, most of the Germans could speak English better than me, in East Germany, the Osses, as they were called, had all learnt Russian in school and were, as a nation, no use to me when I rocked up and realised that if they weren't giving me directions to the station or telling me about their holidays, I had absolutely <laughs> no clue what they were talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. So the stage is set. Anyway, I have been assigned lodging with an elderly couple called Horst and Ingrid. You can use their real names as they were ancient in 1995 okay. and okay. spoke very little English. So the likelihood of them listening to Greatest Hits Radio in 2024 okay. is very, very slight. Wow. Ingrid spoke a smattering of French. Horst had unearthed a dusty old English book from before such things were banned and occasionally greeted me with phrases such as Good morrow, sweet maiden. <laughs> <laughs> and also, she says German accent, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Fares yeah, yeah. well, Miss English. Anyway, What's this book? It's wow. a dusty old English book. Well, from, clearly. Yes. Yeah. Upon arriving at their apartment for the very first day, Ingrid welcomed me with a barrage of German, of which I understood one or two words, which were probably house rules and instructions. For younger listeners, this was obviously before Google Translate and the like, so I nodded along and smiled and threw in a, f a few yeah. ja and natürlich, and she seemed convinced and let me settle into my room. The apartment was on two floors, and my room and bathroom, along with the kitchen and dining area, were downstairs, and Horst and Ingrid's living area was upstairs. On my second day, I was about to leave the apartment and go into town, and being the polite English girl that I was, I thought I'd better let them know I was leaving. I stood at the bottom of the stairs and called up, Hello, ich gehe aus. <laughs> Which I think means I go from. But anyway, uh, that was the right thing to All say, right, I okay. imagine. There was no answer. Hello, no answer. So I decided to go up a few stairs. Hello, ich gehe aus. Still no answer. I could now hear a noise coming from upstairs. Oh, dear. Ah, the oh, vacuum no. was on. That's why they couldn't hear me. Oh. I would need to go up and so they could actually see me. So I... I, ve I ventured up the stairs and I poked my head over the banister. Oh, dear. Only to be met with a blast of angry German. As I realised, yes, they had the vacuum on. Yes, they were cleaning. But also, they were both... Volleknacht. <laughs> Volleyball? Not, not wearing a stitch of clothing. Okay. I apologise profusely. <laughs> Fortunately, sorry was one of the English words that they understood, and I dashed back downstairs and out of the apartment. When I returned later, nothing was said. But the, ho the house rule rules were reiterated to me of... Which, <laughs> upstairs is out of bounds. They absolutely did not need to tell me this. I had learnt my lesson. Father Simon, I'd like to seek forgiveness from the lovely Horst and Ingrid, who I had to live with for a further nine months wow. after this incident, for failing to admit that I didn't have a clue what they were saying to me and inadvertently barging in on them in their birthday suits whilst they cleaned the apartment. I have wondered whether maybe they were German naturists. Lord knows there are enough of them in Europe. But anyway, who knows? I'd like to seek forgiveness from my long-suffering German teachers who'd probably been telling me that my skills were lacking 
before I went on my trip. And lastly, I'd obviously like to seek forgiveness from the assembled collective. In my defense, I was young and stupid, and I did learn my lesson and buckle down. Also, having no one to speak English to for nine months and the lack of anything other than the world service to listen to in English meant that I returned at the end of my trip virtually fluent in German and managed to achieve a decent degree. I never again ventured upstairs and managed to achieve a cordial relationship. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't. Yeah. With Horst and Ingrid. What a name Horst is, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, Hazel wants to say uh. Entschuldigung, which is sorry in German. Okay. But, uh, Sister Susie, what do you say to Hazel, not her real name? Oh, Hazel, you were, you were only a young girl and you were just trying to be polite. And I feel like you were probably more scarred from that than, than um, Ingrid and Horst were. What a so I feel like I, I can't believe you had to live with them for nine months know, after that. Time. I just, I forgive you because you've had, a, you've, you've suffered enough. Brother Matthew. <laughs> I mean, who, who does... <laughs> <laughs> Who does the spring cleaning naked? I can't see how that's possible. Maybe it's a I thing really, in East Germany. I mean, it's a hostage to fortune, surely. Um, maybe something else. Who knows? Um, so, I mean, but also, how are you on this course? And you can only say, I can say, yeah. And, and I've not learned any German at all. Um, so, uh, but Hazel, I mean, you, you learned your lesson. You didn't go upstairs again. Oh, we'll make that mistake twice. Uh, so for that reason, oh, what a laugh to start on a Monday. Uh, yeah, I can definitely for forgive. Okay, all right. So people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Hazel? Uh, on the text, please, 61054. Her uh, first word is Simon. Forgiveness. I mean, she was doing her best. She was. As Susie was saying, she's probably come out of this slightly damaged, mm. I would think. Uh, 61054, first word is Simon. Forgiven or no, that's what we need to know. Thank you. Just before six o'clock, we had a confession from Hazel, who was a student on a year abroad. She was staying in Leipzig with ancient Horst and ancient Ingrid. They lived upstairs, she had to stay downstairs. But one day ventured upstairs because she had to tell them she was going out. Where it turned out they were hoovering in the nude. Yes. That's kind of where it goes. What was the people's verdict? What did we get? Everyone forgives tonight. Peter, forgiven. I don't understand how she ever looked at them again. Never mind, live with them for a year. Uh, Joe on a rainy Salisbury plane. Forgiven. What a great idea. Saves on clothes washing when you're all sweaty cleaning the apartment. And finally, Steph from Bath says, Volig vergeben. Uh, completely forgiven. I'm German and I sometimes clean stark naked. It's very liberating. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, is it a German thing? I don't know. I'm not sold. But anyway, well, Steph, thank you. Very, yeah. very interesting. Anyway, if you have a confession, we would like to receive it. If we use it, you get a smart speaker. Please send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Don't forget, if your confession gets read out, then you get a smart speaker as we grab something from the drinks trolley. There it is. There it is. What are we taking today? Uh, um, Sister I've, Susie. I've grabbed a Sicilian lemon Radler, oh, which nice. is a low ABV, 2.5%. So it's basically a, a posh lager shandy from Left Handed Giant Brewery. It's very tasty. That sounds very good. Can we have a couple up here? Please? Yeah, that'd be nice. Thank you very much. Today's confession comes from Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Father Simon, Brother Matt, Sister Susie. I come to you seeking forgiveness on behalf of my siblings and I. For an act of mischief perpetrated several years ago. Firstly, some background. As a child, I was a huge fan of the Beano. Ah. Mm -hmm. Dennis the Menace, Roger the Dodger were my heroes. And as such, few things got me as excited as a trip to the joke shop. Which gave me the chance to try and emulate those characters and their unique brand of righteous mischief. Which is a very good phrase. On each of these rare occasions, I would save up my pocket money and splash out on whatever I could afford. Whoopee cushions, squirting flowers, and the holy grail, the stink bomb. However, I did not live in Beano Town, and opportunities to put these items to use in the real world were unfortunately few and far between. So these precious items ended up buried in the bottom of my wardrobe and eventually forgotten. A few years later, when I was around 13 or 14, my parents were unfortunately separating and were therefore selling our family home. A viewing was conducted by a young but smarmy couple from the area <laughs> who walked through the house with their noses turned up, loudly proclaiming how they'd tear this down and replace that with something so much nicer. <laughs> Father Simon, I didn't like the thought of my childhood home falling into the hands of these toffee-nosed snobs 
and neither did my brother and sister. But that is the way of the world and eventually an offer was accepted and we started packing our lives into boxes. Just as we finished packing up the house and the final arrangements were made to move, the couple raised a few made-up concerns and asked if the property price could be reduced accordingly. Seeing them for the chances that they were, my parents declined. Smug couple withdrew their offer and we duly set about trying to find the right boxes to unpack. A few days later, their bluff having been called, Mr. and Mrs. Smugface got in touch to say they may have been hasty, and while they certainly weren't happy with the condition of our grotty little home, they would be willing to resubmit their previous offer once again. Uh. My parents accepted, and we were back at DEFCON 1, rapidly trying to repack all over again <laughs> to hit the now looming moving date. So the moving day arrived, vans were hired, favours were called in, furniture dismantled and tensions frayed. The first load of boxes were packed into the moving van, but as we were at the top of the moving chain, we were at the mercy of Lord and Lady Knob, whose solicitor <laughs> advised us that they would be completing at around 9am. Well, 9am came and went, as did 10, 11 and 12. By 1pm, the necessary funds still hadn't been moved, and my parents were terrified that the smug couple were going to pull out of the purchase again. You could have cut the tension with a knife, had all the knives not been packed away. <laughs> Finally, at 2pm, we got the go-ahead. Documents were signed, money was transferred, and so my parents could begin to move into their new properties. The first van drove off, and I went upstairs to gather my remaining boxes for the second trip. In one of the last boxes, I spied a familiar green cardboard box emblazoned with the oh-so-tempting words, stink bombs. Father Simon, had there ever been such an opportunity for righteous mischief? I'd heard of putting fish behind the radiator or prawns in the curtain rod, but I didn't have any seafood. I only had stink bombs. The pack contained three mega, long-lasting, clings-to-everything, vomit-inducing, reaction-guaranteed stink bombs. And I handed one to my brother and one to my sister. We let one off in the eaves of the loft conversion, one in the built-up wardrobe of the master bedroom, and one in the living room. Father Simon, I do not ask forgiveness <laughs> from the smug couple who I think were Octavia and Barty or something like that. Oh, yeah. They were horrible people and I still wouldn't be repentant had I left a whole fishmongers in the airing cupboard. No, I ask forgiveness from my poor parents. As I say, they were extraordinarily stressed and this stress was only exacerbated when they were greeted with a strong smell of rotten eggs emanating from various points throughout the house. The move had already been significantly delayed so they could have done without spending another half an hour checking if there were gas leaks in the house. So hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smug, that smell when you moved in wasn't gas or rotten eggs, it was the smell of three angry children who recognised you for what you were, opportunist money-bag types after a quick buck. We hope the stench lasted a long time and that the ammonia sulphide lingers long in the memory and deep in your pitch-black soul. <laughs> wow! We did, we did fess up to my dad a few years later. And with hindsight, he did see the funny side and agreed with us that the smug couple, who still live in the house to this day, had it coming. I lay myself uh, on your mercy. Well, uh, let's see. I mean, it's righteous mischief is a fantastic phrase, yeah. which I think we're going to use uh, again. What do you say to Dennis, Sister Susie? Well, I do like righteous mischief, Dennis. However, and you know, you are right, Barty and Octavia didn't sound very nice. And let's face it, no one... No one likes moving house. There's nothing worse than packing. And I think that Barty and Octavia might have deserved it, but I don't think your mum and dad did. They must have been so stressed. And the smell when they walked back in for those final boxes. I'm looking for a gas leak. I just can't forgive you for that, I'm afraid. OK, so it's a no. Uh, a no. Brother Matthew. Oh, I have a kindred spirit here in Dennis <laughs> in my class war, don't I? Goodness yes. me, Octavia and Barty. I mean, that got very dark very quickly, didn't it? Pitch black. Black souls, goodness me. There is a rule that says when you're going looking around a house that you want to buy, you never ever say in front of the people who are selling, oh, we're going to knock through here, no. we're going to get rid of this, no. we're going to tear that up. Uh, so, uh, very bad manners from the from the posh couple, and therefore I am definitely going to forgive. Okay, very good. 61054 is the text. The first word has to be Simon. Do you forgive Dennis, yes or no? I suspect he'll be a yes, but with your reasoning. 61054... Before the news, Dennis's confession uh, was about his house being uh, sold.
to Octavia and Barty. Yeah. Didn't like the look of them, so <laughs> let off some stink bombs. That's essentially what it boiled down to. But it was righteous mischief, so it was. Uh, the people's verdict is in. Here it comes. Forgiven, says Johnny. I am totally siding with Dennis on this one. Having someone walk around your home and judging your choices is just horrible. The smug couple deserved it. But Lynn in New Malden says not forgiven, only because ultimately his poor parents had to get those final boxes in from the house with it smelling revolting. Dennis's parents didn't deserve that. But Joan says tonight's confession had my forgiveness as soon as smug couple said they would rip this out and rip that up and the offer lower than the asking price routine. Well, that was the last straw for me. Stink bombs were hilarious. They deserved it. Your confession would be welcome. Send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk Well, it's 5.46 and this is Greatest Hits Radio and it's high time we hit the drinks trolley and that's why that sound is coming in there. Susie, what are you grabbing for us off the drinks trolley today? It's a bit miserable and grey here, so I thought a hot toddy might cheer us all out. Okay, yes. Yes. You can go with whiskey, brandy or rum. You don't need just whiskey. You could choose your uh, preferred spirit. And then lemon juice, honey, and topped up with water. (sighs) Sounds rather good. Sounds good, doesn't it? A little bit early, um, (laughs) but maybe I'll get around to that. We'll save it till later. Yeah, okay, thank you. Today's confession comes from Lynn. None, None of the names have been changed. Really? Okay. On the basis of statute of limitations, I think. Uh, Dear Father Simon and the Forgiveness Collective, please hear my tale and find it in your hearts to forgive a young, at the time, and usually innocent, threesome. It was the summer of 1964, and having completed our GCEs or CSEs at Priestland's Secondary Modern School, my best is Stella, the head girl, Val, sports captain, and I, renowned bad influence, <laughs> were looking forward to bidding farewell to all things academic and heading off into the big wide world. Actually, the head girl in this trio did continue to higher education. We all loved our school and felt it had been pretty good to us, so although we were glad to be leaving it behind us, we wanted to show our gratitude in some way. We spent many afternoons extending long into the evenings in Val's garden. Her mum fueling us with orange squash and homemade cake, planning our farewell and our farewell surprise to the school. We hit on the idea of a banner, which we thought would look good, strung along the front of the gym. Being huge fans of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, we decided to emblazon it with the words, Goodbye, goodbye, we're leaving you goodbye. Missing off the (laughs) skiddly dum bit, which they added an unnecessary addition in this context we thought and the banner wasn't long enough those of our generation may well be singing along by now and for those who aren't (laughs) (laughs) that's what they wanted to put on the banner okay excellent very good val's mum found us an old sheet she was always a good sport and liked to encourage our enthusiasms and a banner was duly furnished in large letters in black paint it looked most impressive further thoughts came to us as we were working away at the banner streamers across the school roof seemed a good idea and toilet rolls were deemed to be appropriate for this we also hit on the idea of painting the windows with window lean more easily removable than whitewash but had exactly the same effect and we needed something to hoist up the flagpole i think it was my mum who found a pair of large black knickers for this and they turned out to be perfect so on the evening before the last day of term we set off for the school with my boyfriend dell Uh And we had inveigled into our plan to shin up the drain pipe to the gym roof to attach our banner and help trail the toilet paper over the building. I mean, what could possibly go go wrong? wrong. Then, having window leaned all the ground floor windows and run our knickers up the flagpole, that's one pair of knickers, I should say, our parting gift had been delivered. The final morning's assembly was not the fond farewell to pupils of previous years. A puce-faced headmaster admonishing the vandalism, what? And demanding that those responsible come forward. The fifth form boys were then all taken aside, kept behind after school, dealt with and interrogated. (laughs) But But to no avail. What did they know? No. Of course, Stella, Val and I never admitted our deed, but I think that 59 years on, that's 59 years on, (laughs) it's time to come clean and ask forgiveness. Mostly from the fifth form boys for being accused of a crime of which they had not a clue, let alone did not commit. 
They were forevermore known as the Filthy Fifth <laughs> and punished appropriately for 1964. But also from the school janitors, tasked with cleaning all the windows, and to our poor headmaster, against whom we bore no grudges, but who clearly didn't appreciate our fond farewell, and what fun we'd had planning and executing it. Also, I ask forgiveness from Dell, my boyfriend at the time, fondly remembered for his generous friendship, but who, as I recall, found climbing the drain pipe not as simple a task as he'd imagined. <laughs> the three of us still get together whenever we can. Val and I are going to be spending a few days reminiscing with Stella in Denmark. Our education has stood us in good stead during the intervening years. We've all experienced reasonable levels of success. Our fleeting <laughs> memories of school are happy ones. Anyway, yours in the hope that you will understand and give us your absolution. And as Pete and Dud would say... <laughs> Okay, so uh, people's verdict then on the way, but Sister Susie pronounces on Lynn, yes, it's her real name, from 59 years ago. Well, Lynn, uh, do you know what? I, I love that you had a group of girls and you, you still talk to each other, you still get together and you still have a lot of fun. And it was only a little prank. However... The problem I've got with is the window lean. If it was anything like my school, it would have been absolutely... There were thousands and thousands of windows. Can yes. you imagine cleaning all that up afterwards? Might have been quite fun at the time, but the poor cleaning lady's probably still there doing it now. So for that reason, I'm not going to forgive. Because the banner was the banner was fine, but I, when you add the toilet rolls and the window lean, it's a whole other thing. However, yeah. uh, morals of a sewer. Right? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going to forgive. I think vandalism feels a little... That seems a bit harsh. It definitely wasn't vandalism. Nothing was broken. They were just putting the, you know, knickers up the drain pipe. And, and Dell, if you didn't want to go up the drain pipe, should have said so. Got a tongue in your head, Dell. He should have mentioned it. He, he wasn't man enough, pipe. I don't think. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, so, and the window lean, here's the point of the point of the window lean is it cleans the windows. So all the windows would have been cleaner than when they started. For the beginning so actually, of the new term. Exactly. So it's all, it's all uh. working in their favour. So nothing to forgive. Okay, so, okay, so... Yeah, uh, forgiven. Okay, so it's one all. So it's <laughs> yeah. entirely down yeah. to you. So, uh, do you forgive Lynn, yes or no? Six, one, five... I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking. Go on. I'm just checking. Yeah, just checking the number. 61054. Five you yeah. start the message with yeah, Simon. Simon. I think it's straightforward. Yes. Okay. 61054. <laughs> start your message with Simon. Do you, do you forgive Lynn? Just before the news, uh, tonight's confession came from Lynn. It was about leaving school and uh, her friends who decided to have a big banner. They used some toilet rolls. They could put windoline on the window. They had black knickers up the flagpole as a way of saying thanks and goodbye to their school. However, the fifth year, the filthy fifth <laughs> took the blame yeah. and not Lynn and Val and Stella. But they're all in Denmark, so they're all fine. The people's verdict is in. Here it comes. I agree with Matt. There's nothing to forgive, says Joe. Beautifully clean windows for the new term, a plentiful toilet paper supply, knickers to use as cleaning cloths. The girls did a great job. Joshua in Lowestoft says, I completely forgive the confession. Matt is right. Nothing to forgive. I they see. even cleaned the windows before leaving. How nice, lol. But Sam in Newcastle says, not forgiven. As a teacher myself, I can't stand end-of-year pranks. They happen every year and cause absolute havoc and mayhem across the entire school. Yes. Why did you put on an slightly <laughs> weak voice when you were being no, no, Sam no, in that Newcastle? Was, that was how Sam said it in, I don't think in so. the text. I yeah. think as yeah, a teacher, yes. he's probably speaking for many teachers. Mm. Enough with the pranks already. <laughs> uh, if you have a tale, send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk And there go. Look, hark, there goes the drinks trolley. From it, Susie's going to... What have you grabbed there from the trolley, Suze? Well, I thought, seeing as it's the last drinks trolley for a little while, um, I thought, why not have the bubbles? So, a rosé champagne, maybe. Bottle of Bollinger, <laughs> they do a nice rosé. Or a night timber um, would be quite nice Oh, as that'd well. be very good. Um, okay. Absolutely. Push the boat out, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. A yeah. couple of bottles uh, ordered by producer Susie. So, today's confession comes from Constable Knapweed. Thanks, Constable mm -hmm. Knapweed. <laughs> Father Simon and the Confessional Collective, I offer my confession to you in the hope you can forgive me for an event that has plagued my mind for over 30 years. Whether we're going to forgive you for the flowery language, Constable Natweed, I'm not sure. Ooh. This whole sorry event started innocently enough 
Whilst I was stationed at a North London police station, life was progressing normally and as a young police constable I spent my time learning from my more experienced colleagues. But events were to take a sinister and unfortunate turn in the form of a new fast track recruit by the name of Martin. He arrived and was introduced to the rest of us as a high flyer. And didn't he just know it? Mm. Within days, he had alienated everybody around him, telling officers with 20 years of hard-earned experience that he knew best because he'd read it in a book. As you can imagine, the situation went from bad to worse, and very soon, murmurs of a lesson began to circulate. Oh As time went by, Martin spent his days watching the rest of us and reporting any event, however small, to his new best friend, the inspector, thus hardening our determination to do something about this outrageous man. It is with this knowledge that I agreed to participate in the events that were to follow. Months went by whilst we waited for the ideal conditions to present themselves, and on one late November night they did. The shift was night duty, and the night was perfect. It was cold, creepy, and very foggy. London lay in silence under a thick blanket, etc., etc. Mm. As we moved wow. into the early hours, the plan was put into action. One police car was dispatched to the 7-Eleven store at Muswell Hill to collect a bag of ice, while the rest of us made their way to Highgate, where we all parked. All the crews from the cars and vans in the area made their way into Highgate Cemetery, where, not far from Karl Marx's last resting place, is a large open crypt in the centre of the cemetery. Many a horror film has been filmed there. Marble columns, ornate sepulchres, Gothic symbols everywhere. The place was eerily quiet, fog swirling around the tombstones, complete silence, not a creature stirred. The darkness was total and overwhelming. We get the picture, Constable yes. Nat, we'd yes. moving yeah. on. <laughs> Once gathered at the crypt, everyone went inside, and the two that had collected the ice now dipped a large cheesecloth into the freezing melt water, and the trap was set. Minutes later, a call went out on the police radio to investigate a disturbance at Highgate Cemetery. As the controller asked various units to respond, all it would seem were engaged in other more serious or time-consuming matters, and so ultimately it fell to Martin to attend the call. He acknowledged the request and said he'd be there in ten minutes. At this point, the anticipation was overwhelming. This thought in our side was about to get his comeuppance. They do say that revenge is a dessert best served cold. This was going to be freezing. And he was about to get it. We fell silent. The freezing cheesecloth was wrung out and ready. Then, cutting through the silence, we heard footsteps on the gravel. Martin was approaching. He was here at last. He was about to get the shock of his life. We flattened ourselves against the clammy walls of the crypt, barely breathing in the pitch blackness. A figure appeared in the doorway, and at that moment the freezing cheesecloth was pulled tight across his face, and we all let out screams and howls so loud <laughs> oh, no. that they sounded as if they'd come from the depths of hell <laughs> itself. Really? <laughs> wow. Okay. The result was instant. In a single moment, he jumped back six feet, screamed, turned and fled with his arms up high, and ran at breakneck speed away through the swirling fog into the darkness where he was enveloped <laughs> by hell. Oh anyway, justice was served. The account <laughs> was balanced. All was good with the world, and we laughed and joked. We congratulated ourselves on the perfect wind-up. That was right until the point that Martin turned up and said, what are, <laughs> what are you lot doing here? In that single moment, victory oh, no. turned to confusion and then to dread, and then it got worse. No. The police radio burst into life. Uh, all units, we've got a report of an elderly priest running down Highgate Hill. He appears to be screaming. Please respond. Over 10 4. Good buddy. Oh, no. can't say that. Apparently, on hearing an unusual noise within the cemetery, this elderly, gentle, caring man of the cloth had decided to investigate. His only intention was to help or offer comfort or assistance to whomever needed it. And he had unwittingly walked straight into our wind up and had suffered what can only imagine. It was a life-changing experience. Obviously, we swore ourselves to secrecy and didn't admit to this fiasco other than taking the elderly gentleman in question to the casualty department at the Whittington Hospital. 
where the medical staff prescribed a sedative. In our defense, he was later heard to say that he had indeed experienced the vision of hell, and as such, his belief in heaven had been somewhat oh. reaffirmed and strengthened. I would plead with you, Father Simon, for your forgiveness for this indiscretion, as we didn't mean to harm anyone with our innocent prank. Ah, well, uh, I'm not sure whether pranks are ever truly forgiven by uh, our crew here, but let's check in with Sister Susie in the pub. Well, I, I just, I'm shocked by this one. I was going to say, you know, Martin sounds like a bit of an annoying bloke, but he does. you know, it still didn't deserve uh, what you were, what you were about to do to him. But that poor, poor priest, he definitely didn't deserve it. You had to take him to hospital. Yes, it was that bad. I just can't, I can't forgive Constable Napweed at all. No and the Whittington Hospital back in the 70s would have been a... It, was, it used to be a workhouse, so mm. it, that wasn't a great source of comfort either. No. A brother no. from the other guy. I mean, you've got a question. What's what's a priest doing in a crypt in the middle of the night uh, in Highgate Cemetery? Seems... I mean, if you thought there was someone down there, they, they, obviously, do they not call for backup? Surely priests have backup as well. Could have got more <laughs> priests to come down well, and have a look. There's something going on in the crypt. Backup. Let's all what, go down there. What priestly radio? I, I'm going on my something own. Something going on. You I never, need help. <laughs> Get me back up. Um, so, and, and also, he's renewed his faith in you know heaven and hell and all of that. So, uh, and everyone comes out of it well, uh, apart from Martin. So, uh, definitely going to forgive. And Constable Nat and, and Mr. Nat Mead and his mates. But apart from that, forgive. Him. And for that yeah. reason, and for that reason, okay. I choose to forgive. <laughs> all right. <Correct>. So, <laughs> we're after the people's verdict, please. Six one zero five four. First word is Simon. Do you forgive Constable Natweed for his wicked Highgate Cemetery prank involving cheesecloth ice, a priest, but not sadly, Martin, the annoying copper. Six one zero five four. First word is Simon. Just before six o'clock, we had a confession from Constable Natweed, a copper. Uh, and it was all about Martin, a, an annoying high flyer. And they planned a scary prank in Highgate Cemetery to take him down a peg or two. It's the dead of night, it's foggy and all that. It was perfectly executed by all the local coppers, except that it wasn't Martin they got. It was an elderly priest who just happened to be wandering through <laughs> yes. the cemetery at the time. And he had to go to the Whittington Hospital. Anyway, mm. uh, the people's verdict is in. Here it comes. Not forgiven, says Stephanie. That poor priest, I can imagine that would have been terrifying. Absolutely forgiven though says Steve as a retired constable of 30 years service I was on the receiving end of many pranks and the shift dished out so many pranks to the new boys and girls it really built great camaraderie uh, Craig in Filey who's also an ex-Met officer says forgiven Martin had it coming every day of the week <laughs> nothing worse than a cop who, th who starts giving it the big one on his first day the poor priest was collateral but would have no doubt laughed and expressed forgiveness all round once he knew the circumstances and Janet from Wallace he says not forgiven for such a grave offence Okay, all right. Brave well, offense. I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much indeed. So your confession, please, would be very welcome. You send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk.